All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Um, I'm MC Owens, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, tonight we're going to talk about vows. And we're going to talk about what that idea means to, to make a vow. We're going to talk about some bodhisattva vows. We're just going to talk all about this idea, which let me show you what the actual word is that we'll be working with. So <clears throat> the word is prangidana, prangidana, which would be translated as a vow or making a vow. So the first thing, let's do what we normally do. We're going to start with some language. And tonight will be interesting. I'm going to actually try to weave together a bunch of different ideas. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I wanted to start tonight by mentioning this. And actually, I just realized I erased it. So this, so that's actually that one of those ends that has the little dot under it. <laughs> so you might have seen this when we write certain Sanskrit words. <clears throat> Sometimes there's just an N. Sometimes there's an N with the a tilde, so what we would call an enye, and other times it's an N with a dot at the bottom. So this is interesting, and I just wanted to share this with you. I'm always learning. I'm always learning more. I'm learning Sanskrit in that way. So just to kind of show you how this works, to yourself, just all on your own, I want you to start to say the word nasal or Nancy, but <clears throat> either one of those words. I want you to start to say the word nasal, but don't say it. Just begin to make the N sound that you would make if you were about to say nasal. <clears throat> and I want you to notice where your tongue goes. It goes to right in front of your front teeth. Usually, for most people, to say the word nasal, the tongue is pushed against right at kind of not touching the teeth, but right before the back of the teeth. <clears throat> now, I want you to start to say the word nachos. And you'll notice that your tongue is not, or it shouldn't be, it's not right up against the, right there, it's kind of curled and touching the top of your mouth, like nachos, right? So the first, the Nancy or nasal, that is just an N. It's just the way in Sanskrit, the letter would be for if it was just an N. If it had the atilde, if it had the little, if it was an enye, that would be more like that word nachos, where the N is being made because the tongue is more at the, uh, what is called the palatal or at the cerebral actually, right, right at the roof of the mouth, not at the teeth. <clears throat> There's another way to say the, the letter N. And what it is, is that if you were to say the word sung, S-U-N-G, like you sung a song, notice where that N is. Notice that it's way in the back of the throat. When you go sung, but the N part of it, your tongue is actually pushed way back in your mouth. So that is actually the N with a dot under it, the ng, an ng. So this is actually, at least to the best of my ability, prani dahana. All right, not prani, not prani, but prani dana. The word nirvanya, nirvana, is 
actually also nirvanya in that way. So it's actually in Sanskrit, it's a whole other letter, by the way, there are three letters. We call them all N, but they're actually three different letters in Sanskrit. And they're because the tongue is in a different spot of the mouth, either a dental, palatal, or way in the back. So, okay, so that's how we pronounce that or how we would <clears throat> attempt to pronounce it. Now let's talk about what it means. So this word, <clears throat> pranidana, we actually encountered part of this word last week. So last week, the theme was apranihita, this idea of no, no pranihita, no goal, no aim, no destination, no direction. That was a pranihita. So the root of the word is the same as this word, pranidahana. So that word, prani, means a wish, a desire, but it's not a desire like chanda, if you know your other Buddha words, Buddhist words for desire. A prani is like a, a hope, a hope in that way, like a wish in that sense. And then the other part of that word, this will be interesting. So dahana. So this sounds a lot like the word for giving, right? Dana. But it's not dana, it's dahana. And so the root of the word dahana is dar, which is the same root of the word dharma, and it means to hold. So a prani dahana, oh, and actually, dahana, dana is the giving. Dahana is a, a gift holder. So they're etymologically related in that sense, but it's rather kind of about giving and kind of receiving, but I wouldn't actually want to actually even say that. I shouldn't have said that. It's not about giving and receiving. A prani dahana is kind of a, like a, a wish holder, holding a wish, if you will. This is, this is what the word means literally etymologically, by the way is it has something to do with a wish and something to do with a container or a holder of that wish. So what this word pranidahana gets translated as is as a vow, making a wish or making a vow. And this is gonna be one of those words that is present in the earliest forms of Buddhism. You will find it, I think it's, Panyidhana, it's very similar in Pali. It's just not with the hard R, not prani, but prani. So that idea is part of the original Buddhist path. Tonight, I'm going to kind of do my normal thing where I talk about what this word meant in the, in the original form of Buddhism and what it means for the Mahayana tradition and the Bodhisattva path. So what we're talking about, of course, is a, a wish, or like I said, a wish or a hope or a desire. But if you go rooting around the Buddhist dictionaries, Buddhist encyclopedias, or even if you go to the main sources, the suttas, a, a pranidhana is always a, a spiritual hope or wish. It's never presented as a mundane worldly desire for something like wishing that you get a new car or wishing you get a raise or wishing none of those traditionally fall under the category of a pranidhana. In the original form of Buddhism, it was more about, or seemingly, it was more about say, take something like precepts. 
say, taking something like the five precepts. Let's just take the first of the five precepts, the prohibition against killing or violence in that way. So the idea is, is that if one were to make a vow of observing the precepts, there's, a, there's actually, a, now that I think about it, a number of different verbs that are involved in that because one actually receives precepts. In English, we would actually say with, that we take precepts, which is interesting, that we use the language that we take vows or take precepts, whereas in the original languages, Sanskrit and Chinese, it's about receiving precepts. But then the vow, the vow is this intention. It's kind of related to a samkalpa, if you're familiar with that idea, but it's this idea of making a vow to be nonviolent, making a vow to speak truthfully, to be a truth speaker, making a vow to follow the precepts, making a vow to get enlightened. A pranidhana is always sort of this wish or a vow to achieve some sort of spiritual goal in that sense. So I want to make that clear that that's sort of always been the kind of connotation of this. But then when you move into the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, basically the pranidhana is synonymous with the bodhisattva vow. The Bodhisattva vow is actually the very first talk or one of the first talks that I gave in this series many months ago now, where I started talking about the Bodhisattva path. Like what constitutes the Bodhisattva path? Well, the first thing that constitutes the Bodhisattva path is that you make the Bodhisattva vow. And I did a whole class about that, so I'm not going to go all over it. But the bodhisattva vow, the, this pranidhana, it's traditionally given as a twofold vow. The twofold nature of this vow is about basically becoming a buddha, but it, it's not given in the language, it's not given as, oh, I vow to become a buddha. The specific language is actually about vowing to attain omniscience, what is called sarvanyana, all knowledge, all knowingness. Now, it's kind of well understood that only a Buddha has sarvanyana, only a Buddha has such knowledge. So when one makes a vow to achieve such knowledge, one is basically making a vow to become a Buddha. But I just want you to know that the language is specifically about attaining this all knowledge. And right along with that, and in fact, they're understood to be basically two sides of the same coin, but right along with the vow to achieve all knowledge is the vow to make sure all sentient beings <laughs> achieve that same state of all knowledge. And this is where you start to get the, the iteration or the way the, descript, the description of the Bodhisattva vow, where it's a, a vow to not achieve enlightenment until all other sentient beings have achieved enlightenment before me. That is sort of like, if you go Googling and looking on the internet, that's usually the way that the Bodhisattva vow is presented. But I want you to kind of actually be, or I want you to know that so much of achieving that state of all knowledge has to do with the abandonment of the little egocentric sense of self. <laughs> so you got to give up that little sense of self. And ultimately, you would need to abandon the subject object relationship. And so what the Bodhisattva begins to realize is that there is no full enlightenment until all beings are enlightened. Because 
if I'm in some dualistic state of mind where I'm over here getting enlightened while everybody else isn't, well, that creates a very dualistic mind where it's about me and everybody else. So all of a sudden, we realize that that bodhisattva vow of achieving omniscience and having all sentient beings achieve omniscience are actually the same goal in that way. And that's why it's often not even presented as two different aspects of the vow. It's just this one vow to achieve omniscience and to have all sentient beings achieve it as well. So on that note, we notice that the pranidhana of the bodhisattva and the pranidhana of the early Buddhist monastic who is going for purification of themselves. These are two different ways of approaching the vow. One is a vow for one's own enlightenment, and the bodhisattva is a vow for a, what would be called universal awakening or universal enlightenment. So let's talk about vowing. So I have a lot of things to say about a vow what it means to take a vow in that sense. So whether we're talking about early Buddhism or the Mahayana Bodhisattva type of Buddhism, I think there's really something really important to notice about what it means to take a vow. And the example that I wanna use is and I've used this one before, so many of you have heard this, but I want to use the example of being or identifying as a vegan. Or, you know, pick, pick your dietary uh, situation, but I'm talking specifically about the idea of identifying as a vegan. Now, the thing about that is. I used to identify as a vegan for many, many years. I identified that way, which is to say I ate a vegan diet and I identified as a vegan, meaning I would tell, my, tell people I am a vegan. I would, you know, own or, 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 you know, identify as that. I don't anymore. And I'll tell you why. For me, part of what I realized in my um, practice is so, so much of the Buddhist path is about, well, they would call it avoiding views, drishtis. In modern parlance, in our kind of modern world, we would call these ideologies various different ideologies. We, of course, know about political ideologies, but even, of course, veganism is an ideology. There's an ideology involved in that regarding animal rights, regarding all kinds of things. So Buddhism has always sort of avoided identifying with an ideology, even Buddhism. <laughs> and so how do you navigate that then? Well, what I realized in my, again, in my life, in my practice, in my pursuit, I realized that as a, as a Buddhist in that sense, having essentially taken the precepts, having essentially made a vow of nonviolence, that is my intention, that's my samkalpa, what I realized about the beauty of the vows is, is that when one makes a vow, let's say the vow to be not violent, that is not ascribing to an ideology. It's not identifying with an ideology. It's actually about action, not, uh, it's about praxis, not doxis, is what we could say. It's about doing not all of this ideological conceptualization. And so when one makes a vow, you know what? I don't want to be violent. 
in fact, I want to make a vow to avoid violence, to be, you know, to observe ahimsa, to observe nonviolence. If you've done that, if you've made a vow to avoid violence, it could be that you are given a giant plate of <laughs> murdered flesh food. And you say to yourself, this is not in line with my vow. And so you don't eat it. If that's, if that's how you're interpreting violence, if that's how you're interpreting the vow, then it is in line with your vow to not eat that. And you don't have to get ideological about it. You don't have to say, well, I'm not eating it because I'm a vegan. You could say, I'm not eating it because I avoid violence and I consider this violence or I consider it perpetuating violence. And so again, I just want you to notice the, it's subtle, but it's actually really significant in terms of, again, identifying with an ideology and then the way that that dreaded ego sneaks into that when it's about, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm a vegan. So I don't do that and yada, yada, yada. Versus sort of this internal conversation, if you will, about having made a vow and then having to actually ask yourself all the time, is this in line with my vow? If I've made a vow to be a truth speaker and to avoid false speech, then when I'm about to say something, I should be wondering, <laughs> is this true? Is this in line with my vow? So just want to point that out about that really subtle but important difference between kind of ideologies and vows. Everybody doing okay with where we're at? Cool. So the next thing I want to tell you about regarding a vow is what I think is the most interesting thing. This will probably be, in my opinion, the most interesting thing I say tonight. So language is a very interesting thing and oh, oh hey no oh i'm sorry i had i had a question but i'll i can wait oh, okay no please please i'm on i'm moving to a new section so please with the identifying as vegan versus taking it out of being nonviolent, is there something to seems like there might be a relationship to like attachment versus presence also because like situation to situation, it might be more violent to eat the animal, or it might be more violent to say, nope, I'm vegan, and be a jerk to whoever's serving you the meat. And so you can be, if you're not identifying with or attached to the ideology, then you can be more present to, like, judging situations as you go. Is that? Excellent. Does that make sense? That's, that's how I understand it. That's, a, I would consider an excellent way of putting it, totally. Okay. Yeah, and it's what, I, it's what I meant by the subtle but important differences between the two. And definitely, Vicki, that idea that we notice like, oh, as soon as I'm identified ideologically, there's kind of not a lot of room in that sense. Whereas the vow is always applicable. And like you said, it can be about well, you didn't say utilitarianism. I don't want to say utilitarianism, but it can be a little bit utilitarian where it's like, which is the more violent thing to do here in that sense? Which is the more truthful thing? Which is the more kind thing? And so on and so forth. So, awesome. Okay. Um, so the next thing I was going to mention about vowing that I think is very interesting, and it's going to be relevant to the sutra that I do think we'll get to tonight. So funny thing about language. So I've mentioned this one in the past, but it's one of these really, really deep, subtle ideas that, uh, you know, doesn't always make a lot of sense. So. In terms of language, most of the time, like 99.9% .9 of the time, although I shouldn't put it that because there's other ways of speaking, but a lot of the time, 
when we speak, the way, the way that we speak is what would be called either descriptive or in a sense, demonstrative. And what I mean is, is that when I say, this, this is a black cup. When I say that, the, the words that are coming out of my mouth are describing this. But when I say the word black cup, that sound, those words, black cup, are not a black cup. Those sounds, those words point to and describe something. Now, even if I were to say, tomorrow I'm going to go shopping, that's descriptive as well. I'm describing for you something that will take place. And what I really kind of want to point at is that when I say, I'm going shopping, when I say that, I'm not shopping. I am, I am describing an event that will take place. But my point is, is that the words and the language of I'm shopping are not the same as the verbal act of shopping. There is, though, a, a way of speaking. And if you get really uh, geeky about this, if you get into like serious uh, philosophy of language type of stuff where people analyze these types of things, rather than being in the descriptive or demonstrative mode, there's another mode of speaking. And it's, what it, it's what's called a performative speech act. And there's very, very few instances in which this is the case, in which it is true. But it is actually, it's a very subtle, interesting thing to notice. And the kind of the, the number one example of a performative speech act is making a vow or and or taking an oath. So making an oath or taking an oath and, or making a vow are kind of basically the same thing in that way. And one of the kind of classic examples of this is do you so-and-so take this person so-and-so to be your lawfully wedded spouse? When you say, when, when the participant in a wedding when they are asked the question, do you take so-and-so to be your spouse? When the person says, I do, a very interesting thing happens, which is that the speech is the verbal act. Meaning you saying I do is you agreeing to do that thing. So it's a really weird moment where speech and action coincide. And it's something actually that, well, at first, you know, at first blush, this seems like, mm, you know, so what? But if you begin to notice, it's like, oh, there's another place where this happens too, which is if you go to court and they say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Notice that vowing to tell the truth in a court of law, which could then constitute perjury if you did and you could go to jail and all of this stuff, right? Notice that vowing to tell the truth or vowing to get married, notice that these are two very serious situations. And then notice that these various situations are resting on a performative speech act. If you were to really get into philosophy of language and go back to, well, you'd go back quite a ways. 
But what you would begin to notice is, is that in a pre-modern world, performative speech acts were a little more common. And they were more common because of that potency, the potency of having one's voice and one's action coincide. There's a lot more that I could say about this. It has actually to do with just the whole world of religion and a kind of an understanding where when one is enunciating the name of a god, there's a way in which that enunciation, that, that, that sound is the god. And so there's a way where, and, and you notice this when there's all these kind of uh, taboos or prohibitions against saying certain names at certain times or in certain places. And so all of this is referring back to an older world where, where speech was, in particular, performative speech acts were really, really important. And again, I just point to um, taking a, um, an oath in a court or making a, a wedding vow. Those are like the remnants of a much older world where that stuff happened a lot more and it was even more potent, but it still lingers in our culture and in our society in that sense. And I just wanna point out to you that subtle difference between language as descriptive versus language as actually being this performative speech act. So that's important or it will be important to understand, well, to understand a deeper level of the reading tonight. So speaking of which, uh, any questions about all of that preliminary remarks about vows? Cool. So let's get into the sutra. So as you all know, I do have a quick question. Oh, yeah, Dean, Rocket. Michael. Um, thank you. Uh, just to going back uh, just a few minutes, I was thinking, uh, you know, you talked about the the vows to tell the truth, the vows to uh, not be violent. And I, I'm thinking, and, and then you were also talking about how you refer to your own sense of what does that mean, et cetera. The, the definitions here are really um, like, it, I think people have different definitions of like what's within the scope of those. I wonder how much the Buddhists in history at least, would have you apply like a completely subjective uh, standard to say, okay, I vowed this, but I'll decide mm. you know, what's violent. I'll decide what's truth. Or is there is there a, a sense that one needs to consult uh, an outside source to determine uh, <laughs> what falls within and without? Great question. Really, really great question. So I, I'll tell you, I did my, uh, my master's thesis on kind of Buddhist monastic discipline. And in particular, I looked at the way that the Chinese Buddhist adopted or used the traditional Buddhist system. And so that required learning a bit about that original system. And what's interesting about it is, is that not a lot of people know this, but traditionally within the world of the Buddhist monastic order, so the Sangha, but Sangha of monastics, you know, they, they twice a month on the new moon and the full moon, monastics um, shave their heads. And in fact, traditionally they shaved head to toe, pubic hair, everything, bald. That was the traditional mode. Eyebrows as well, by the way. So you take a, a really, really serious uh, shower, <laughs> shave all your hair, and then all the monastics, and this would be going on at a nunnery as well, 
also new moon, full moon, all the monastics get together and they chant what is normally called the Pratimoksha, which is a kind of a summary of all of the rules of the monastic order. And then, so has anybody broken these rules? And it's at that moment that if you, and Dean, this goes to your question, you, each person looks into their own heart, as it were. And it's at that moment that they are given the opportunity to say, you know what? I broke rule number whatever, and I did whatever it was. And then there is a discipline that is given based upon the severity of the rule. And then the discipline is usually uh, sequestration, I guess it would be called. You are removed from the monastic order for well, if it's just a little crime for a night, if it's a bigger crime for a day or two or a week or a month, or if it's one of the four most serious crimes, you're kicked out. But to Dean's question, as I understand it, each monastic had to decide for themselves whether it was weighing on them. And this was their opportunity to confess and it is actually kind of a well understood historical idea that the Buddha kind of invented confession. At least there's not a lot of records of it before the Buddha. He also seems to have invented what would be called the processes of truth and reconciliation. It's or what we today would call the processes of truth and reconciliation. If you don't know what that is, it's just a whole other way of thinking about law and order and, pun and crime and punishment. And it has to do with people actually owning up to what they've done in order to bring back social cohesion. That's the premier goal of, of truth and reconciliation. The Buddha seems to have invented a system of, of truth and reconciliation where there's opportunities to confess wrongdoings and there's processes for kind of reestablishing cohesion. So, mm. so. Uh, we, when, um, when you would go to that, uh, the, the, the group and you say, I think I, you know, I did something wrong. Do, it sounds like you're going to define uh, what you think you violated and you're going to state what you did, and so then um, there's sort of a decision based on uh, what you've admitted to, uh, it, as opposed to maybe like a, a like well, like people would people you know possibly say well I think he should get ten years I think she should get, did you know they I, I wonder how. Uh, much it's um, like thrown to the others to figure out the punishment or is it like you know ahead of time something like that I I know this is all very old, old stuff so I don't know if there's any record of this yeah and indeed let me say that before I say anything more you know uh, what I'm referencing is sort of like the oldest known tradition and the records that we have of that happening in, in reality, of course, Buddhism becomes quite an institution and many of them, and they all function a little differently. They all, all of that. So I can't really speak too much in that way. I will say that there is also though, a, it's also possible that you could get outed <laughs> where another monk could say, I saw monk so-and-so doing whatever. And uh -huh. then it, at that point, monk so-and-so would have to either say no i wasn't doing that and there's actually even processes that the buddha laid down for have for reconciling a dispute like that i see okay yeah the the buddhist vinaya or vinaya is a very interesting legal corpus in the way that it all functions going back though to your original question though it is really seemingly though especially if you read the, the Pali canon, if you go through it, it's a lot of descriptions of things weighing on practitioners' hearts. 
and that's how they know <laughs> like that's that there's no um that is the litmus test for whether one has kind of done something wrong in that way and then the what it is though would be normally would be easily it would easily fit into a different category to which the the punishments if you will are already well established ah okay yeah. got it thank you thank oh you. no thanks dean yeah i love the, the those kinds of technical questions cool all right um so we're going to dive back into the sutra we're not going to be hearing about those kinds of vows though so we're not going to be hearing about kind of monastic vows. We're not going to be hearing about vows in that way. We're going to be hearing about Manjushri Bodhisattva's 10 vows. And Tanya just put the link for the sutra in the chat. Um, she put the link for, of course, the English translation from the Tibetan at 84,000.read. I'm might be reading from that one i'm not sure though i don't think um but nonetheless there's also of course the english translation from the chinese and i have my own english translation from the chinese so what happens is as you may recall we are where are we right we are we have been on the vulture's peak for a very long time now uh and the buddha the buddha's there but the whole sutra has actually basically primarily been this discourse between bodhisattva manjushri and bodhisattva lion courage thunderous voice and we are to understand that lion courage thunderous voice is a a young bodhisattva, a young aspiring bodhisattva that has all of these questions about the bodhisattva path. And in particular, bodhisattva lion courage has had all of these questions regarding Manjushri's pure land. Now, Manjushri's pure land is this idea of, well, it's about this kind of this language or this idea of what the, what the world will be like when Manjushri attains complete full enlightenment. Like what will Manjushri's world, what will Manjushri Bodhisattva's Buddha land be like? And what happens at this point in the sutra, after having asked about the past, adventures of Manjushri and the future adventures of Manjushri, and even having asked about the current enlightened status of Manjushri, and those are all from Dharmador's past, the, at this point, the Bodhisattva thunderous voice, he asks, he asks Manjushri basically, let me see, what kinds what kinds of merit or virtue, what kinds of merit or virtue and adornments will you achieve for your Buddha land? So in the Tibetan one, I think it reads more of like, basically like your Buddha land, how will it be decorated? With what kinds of virtues will it be adorned? And Manjushri does the same thing he normally does. And he says, basically, he says the thing that we've been going over before, which he says, well, I'd tell you if I was seeking enlightenment, but I don't seek enlightenment. So there's nothing really for me to tell. So he, he's been doing these kind of very intellectual avoiding of the question. And so once again, and it's kind of funny that this happens, the Bodhisattva then turns to the Buddha. Or actually what happens is, is that Manjushri says, if a Bodhisattva speaks of the merits and magnificence of their future Buddha land in the presence of an existing Buddha, 
then they would be praising their own virtues. And that basically will not do. So then the Buddha says to Manjushri, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. You can tell them by what kind of vows you will adorn your Buddha land so that the Bodhisattva's hearing of those vows will resolve to fulfill them as well. Okay, so that's the introduction of the vows. So rather than describing all the wondrous, beautiful things about Manjushri's Buddha land, the Buddha says, man, yeah, Manjushri, you can tell them what kind of vows your Buddha land is adorned with. And then that's what Manjushri proceeds to do. So if you've been, if you've been following the sutra up to this point, you'll know that people have been saying things, <laughs> meaning it's been like, hey, Manjushri, what about this? And Manjushri answers, and then they ask the Buddha. But upon this, at this moment of the sutra, after the Buddha has told Manjushri, go ahead, tell him about your vows. Thus instructed by the Buddha, Manjushri rose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, joined his palms, and said to the Buddha, World honored one, now, by the miraculous powers invested in me by the Buddha, I'm going to speak my vows. Those who wish to seek the great enlightenment should all listen attentively, study them according to the Dharma, and fulfill them after hearing them set forth. When Manjushri knelt with his right knee on the ground, the six kinds of quakes shook Buddha lands as numerous as the sands of the Ganges River throughout the Ten Directions. So before I read the first vow, <laughs> I want you to notice how like serious it things got right there. And I wasn't um I wasn't loading the language. Interesting terms, right? Like uh the terms by the power invested in me by the Buddha. I've heard that language before, right? <laughs> you hear it at a wedding. Isn't that interesting, right? And notice this kind of very serious event of the right knee on the ground and the palms joined and all of that. Like things are getting serious. And what I would suggest, given what I was saying about the Performative Speech Act, Manager Shri is about to announce, enunciate his vows. And so, like, the, the sutra seems to know that this is about to get very serious, very solemn in that way. So the earth shakes in six different ways. This is a, a common trope within the world of kind of Buddhist sutras. And then what happens is, is that Manjushri then says aloud this thing about his vows. And it's going to take a little bit to get through this first vow. There's a lot going on here. Yeah, so let's see. The first thing I want to tell you before we try to read it, I've got to tell you that I've in tra I translate a lot of sutras. And it's very, very common within Mahayana Buddhist sutras for a bodhisattva to, um, to reiterate or to announce their vows. They are almost always 10 in number. This is a very, very common thing. There's a bodhisattva named Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra's 10 vows, which come from a whole other sutra. Those are kind of sometimes considered the bodhisattva 10 vows. But I just want you to know that actually there are many of these sutras, many bodhisattvas, 
And there's this thing where they all take 10 vows, but the vows are different for each bodhisattva. And it's what makes reading these Pure Land Sutras interesting is hearing these slight differences. But I want you to know that this is common to find all of a sudden a bodhisattva announcing their vows. They're always 10 in number. And as a translator, I got to tell you, it's always really, really hard to understand the tense that these vows are given in, meaning it's not really super clear whether the tense should be the future tense in terms of vowing that in the future something will happen, or if it's like in the present tense or it's in conditional, like it's really unclear how one should translate these things. So I'm going to just kind of work my way around. I'll probably just stick with the tense that's given here, but I want you to know that that these vows are being spoken in a really interesting way. Okay, so that's the first thing that I want you to know. So the first vow reads something like this. Manjushri addressed the Buddha saying, hundreds of thousands of millions of nayutas, of kalpas ago in the past, I vowed, and this is given as a quote. So again, the, the sutra makes it clear that this is something that's said aloud as a vow, as a performative speech act. So hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas ago, I vowed, if all the future Buddhas in countless Buddha lands throughout the 10 directions, whom I see with my unhindered divine eye, if they are all not persuaded by me to engender bodhicitta or taught by me to cultivate giving, moral discipline, patience, vigor, meditation, and wisdom, and to attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment, I shall not attain bodhi. Only after the fulfillment of this vow shall I attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So that's the first vow. So I want you to notice it, it's in line with what I was saying at the beginning of the talk, where the Bodhisattva vow, like the vow in general, it's always about bringing all sentient beings to a certain level of awareness. And as it mentioned there, the vow is given in this language of, and if that, if that doesn't happen, I'm not going to become enlightened. That's my vow. Like I'm only be going to be fully enlightened when all sentient beings have. And then in this case, this is a really interesting one. So he says that I have vowed that all of these, and we are to understand that when he says, if all of the Buddhas in countless Buddha lands, whom I see with my unhindered divine eye, if they're not persuaded by me to engender bodhicitta, if, if you read that, you'd be like, but wait a minute. <laughs> If they're Buddhas, they've already engendered bodhicitta. And so the language of this takes a little bit of detective work. And what we realize as we read kind of further down, we realize what Manjushri is saying is that with, with the divine eye, all these Buddhas to be. <laughs> they're not Buddhas yet, but they're all these infinite sentient beings that will become Buddhas. So if all of those sentient beings are not persuaded by me to generate bodhicitta and practice the paramitas, 
giving, moral discipline, patience, determination, meditation, and wisdom. If they don't, if they're not persuaded by me to get on board and start practicing, then I won't achieve full awakening. I will not achieve enlightenment. That's my first vow. Any questions about that first vow? <laughs> yeah, Tanya. I don't know if this is so much about the first vow, but I hope you don't mind if I just ask mm. this. It, just, it has it's, to do with this uh, the, until all sentient beings. And so I guess maybe it is a bit related, but also I was thinking about something you said earlier and about non-dualism. And I mean, is this all, is this, this whatever somebody talks about until all sentient beings, is it, I, I don't know, I'm being overly, overly reductionistic here, but is it pointing to until dualism drops, mm. nothing's going to happen? Um, I would certainly, I would certainly read it that way at a kind of ultimate level. But I don't think that's, you know, what's being said in the text in that way, but I think it is a way to understand the message, if that makes sense. Yeah. One, so one of the things that, yeah, I mean, so I, I want to remind everybody of this. And it's something that I haven't said in a long time, so I guess I should really remind everybody. So for me... If, so if you haven't been coming to Dharma Doors or you haven't been coming for a while, I want to remind you that for me, what makes the Mahayana Buddhist sutras, all of these sutras that I'm always reading on Sunday nights, what makes them so interesting to me is that they are very, very aware that they are literature. They are, these sutras, the Mahayana sutras, are very aware that they are texts they are very aware that they are are going to be read and what i mean by that is and this is what many of you know if you read the older you know grab if you read the older pali suttas these are clearly records of events that happened in the past where somebody that they called the buddha told somebody else that was known as Shariputra, this, this person that they call the Buddha told this person that Shari, called Shariputra some things. And this is a record of those things that were said. They've been preserved. And when you read these, they, they read as if they are historical records of events that had happened. They are to be understood that way, all of that. When you read a Mahayana Buddhist Sutra, though, it knows that it's a story. It knows that these characters are fictional characters in a book that you're hearing about. It knows that. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend too much like backing up this thesis of mine. It's not really a thesis. It's pretty well, very clear because the sutras talk about themselves as sutras and they tell the reader, hey, reader, you should copy this sutra down and share it with friends of yours. So Mahayana sutras, they, they very knowingly kind of break the fourth wall of literature. It, it, in, in essence, they're kind of written in a weird second person, kind of, where they're all, where you, the reader, are always part of the story. And so what I mean by that, Tanya, to kind of get it back around to your question, or just sort of what you were asking about, it's very important to kind of keep in mind that this is not a story a document about somebody named Manjushri from the past, the only Manjushri is, is the one that I'm talking about, like the, the one that's popping out of the sutra in that way. And so now, if we, re, if we understand that this is not about 
somebody in the past making 10 vows, but it's actually about this book we're reading, this sutra we're reading. And as I often say, I, I get to play the role of Manjushri tonight. I get to read the words of Manjushri. I get to do the performative speech act in that way. And so in other words, Tanya, what I'm getting, trying to get around to is that the Manju Shri that's doing the persuading of sentient beings to become Buddhas, to generate bodhicitta, is the Manju Shri that we're reading about. That's the one who's actually currently, if, I, if I'm doing my job well enough, it's that Manju Shri that is currently attempting to persuade everybody listening to generate bodhicitta and cultivate the paramitas. So all of a sudden, what I'm getting at with this is that there's an interesting kind of time collapse that happens when you read these sutras, because now all of a sudden, like, we are implicated in the sutra in that way. And so, yeah, so I just want to point out that we are all the future Buddhas that are potentially being persuaded by Manjushri. And Manjushri, quote unquote, will not achieve full enlightenment until we have all been persuaded to develop bodhicitta. So I, I, I actually want to in a way, mystify what's going on. I actually don't want to demystify what's going on. I would prefer to mystify it, if that makes sense. Because <laughs> I actually think what's going on in the sutra right now is supposed to be kind of mystical. I don't think it's supposed to be very rational and logical in that sense. Cool, everybody doing okay with the, with the mystification of the Dharma? <laughs> cool. So there's more to this first vow, by the way. So after that, at that time, all the bodhisattvas in the assembly had this thought. How many Buddhas can Manjushri see with his unhindered divine eye? Right? <clears throat> Knowing what all those bodhisattvas were thinking, the world honored one said to bodhisattva lion courage thunderous voice, noble one, what do you think? Suppose a 3000 great thousand world system were to be ground into minute particles. What do you think? Could the number of all of those minute particles be understood through counting? Could you count all the minute particles if you ground the entire universe into minute particles? What do you think? Could all of that be counted? Bodhisattva lion courage thunderous voice answered, no world honored one, it cannot. The Buddha said, Noble one, Manjushri with his unhindered divine eye sees more Buddhas in the Eastern direction than the number of such minute particles. And the same is true of the South, the West, in the North, in each of the intermediate directions, as well as above and below. Okay, so that concludes the first vow, in, incalculable, incalculable numbers of sentient beings in all directions. That's, that's who Manjushri has vowed to bring to bodhicitta and to enlightenment. That's the, the first vow. <laughs> so I, I wanted to say this too at the beginning. Yeah. So I wanted to say this at the beginning too. I kind of alluded to this, I think in maybe last week or the week before, but so when it comes to these sutras, I think on the one hand, 
you could. Yeah, th this is actually what I meant by I'm trying to mystify this. You could demystify all of this in a way, and you could get out all of the the hyperbole of grinding the universe into all of this, you could dispense with all of that. And it could be understood just as this altruistic vow. Altruism is just, I'm, I'm worried about everybody. Not worried in that way, but I have concern for everybody. I have great compassion for everybody. Infinite numbers of sentient beings, all the sentient beings. I vow to be compassionate towards all sentient beings. It, it could be basically that simple. But what's with all the theatrics, right? What's with all of the hyperbole? What's with all of that? Well, if, if you've studied the Vajra Sutra, which I'm always encouraging people to study the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, if you've studied the Vajra Sutra, then you might have heard an echo of that sutra, because it's in the Vajra Sutra where the Buddha actually says to Subhuti, hey, Subhuti, what do you think? If somebody were to grind the entire universe into minute particles, what do you think? Would all those minute, minute particles be many or not? That's a, basically a direct quote from the Vajra Sutra. And here we have it again. So the first thing that I want to mention about that, so the incalculable, the incalculable nature of sentient beings. So I think when you first hear, when one first hears that language, that Buddhist language of these infinite incalculable sentient beings, at first, that can seem hyperbolic. Again, it can seem like it's exaggeration. But then you might think, oh, maybe the Buddha is talking about, like, maybe when the Buddha says sentient beings, he's talking about all the sentient beings, like all the bugs and all the birds and all the fleas and all the everything. Well, yeah. If you include all the sentient beings, then that's approaching incalculable status, right? <laughs> well, the thing about it is, is that I, I, I think that there's a way that even if you include all the bugs and all the birds and all the fleas and all the animals and all the everything, from a Buddhist point of view, all of those sentient beings are still calculable. When the Buddhists, or especially the Mahayana Buddhists, when they start talking about the incalculable number of sentient beings, I think one idea that's important to keep in mind is that the Buddhists are very aware of well, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I can't go too deep down this road, but I just, and I've talked about this before, but it's about that idea that each, each one of you, because you have your own set of eyes, because you all have your own set of ears, so your own body, and because those sensory organs are conditioned in a certain way, and so your sensory reactions are different, and because of perception and consciousness, meaning the other skandhas, the Michael that you're listening to or watching right now is, of course, your own special little version of me. And it's no, it's not similar. I mean, it's similar, but it's not the same as the person next to you. It's not similar to, or it's not the same as, it's similar probably, but it's not the same as anybody else. And in fact, 
when I look in a mirror at this body, or even when I look down at this body, there's my impression of what this body looks like. There's my impression of what this voice sounds like. And so we can, and this is what I'm often talking about in Dharma Doors, we can think in terms of there being an objective reality where there's just, you know, just Michael. And then there's all of these different people with a perspective on Michael. You know, the objective me that everybody is having their own impression of, including, including me. Well, who or what gets to view this Michael, the objective Michael? Who gets the God's eye view on Michael? And what the Buddhists realize is, oh, nobody ever has that objective view. And so all there is, is the infinite amounts of subjective views. And there isn't one solid objective Michael that everybody is just getting their own impression of. There is only the own impressions in that sense. So if you understood what I just was talking about, then you understand how just regarding Michael, there is an incalculable number of me in that regard. And that's just me. Forget about every single flea Forget about every single bird that has multiple infinite perspectives on it. So now if you're beginning to think about that, meaning all of those impressions in that way, all of a sudden, the grains of sand of the Ganges River start to sound like a good starting place in terms of a, a, a way of talking about it. So what I mean is, is that maybe hyperbole is not actually what they're going for. Maybe they're actually trying to talk about something that's a little, well, maybe they're talking about a way that is not locked into that objective view of reality, which again would be very calculable, very conceivable in that sense. So, that's the first thing I kind of wanted to say about all of the, the language of all that. Like, yes, the first vow of Manjushri could probably be put a little more simply, but maybe not. Maybe the vow is actually that kind of complicated in that sense. All right, everybody doing okay with the first vow? Cool. Um, so let's read another one, just because that first one's kind of a little tricky. Not that they all aren't, but so <clears throat> Manju Shri then said to the Buddha, "Furthermore, world honored one, I have vowed to combine the worlds of Buddhas." as innumerable as the sands of the Ganges River into a single Buddha land and to adorn it with incalculable, intermingled, exquisite jewels. If I can't do this, I shall never attain Anuttara, Samyak, Sambodhi. So now Manjushri is vowing... <laughs> to combine the innumerable Buddha lands throughout kind of the universe, to combine them all into a single Buddha land, and then to adorn it with all of these intermingled exquisite jewels. 
what could it possibly mean, right? To take this innumerable number of Buddha lands equal to the grains of the Ganges, sand grains of the Ganges River. What could it mean to then take all of them and combine them into a single Buddha land? Huh, <laughs> I wonder. I'm glad I gave that introduction that I did regarding the Bodhisattva vow and this idea of bringing all sentient beings uh, to awakening in that sense. So there's two, two aspects, of course, to this vow. The one vow or one aspect is combining all these Buddha lands into a single Buddha land. And then the second part is adorning it with exquisite jewels. So this is pure interpretation, of course. I don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm saying this is exactly what is being said here. This is an interpretation. But if you, if you followed what I was saying a moment ago, and it's so funny because I didn't even intend to tell you all of that, but I'm glad I did. If you were following what I was just talking about, no singular objective reality that we are all having perspectives on, but an infinite number of subjective realities. If, you're, if you understand that idea, then it's very easy to tell you that if you understand that view of reality where we are, each of us are rather subjectively at the center of what are called the 10 directions. And the point is, is that if we're in option number one, where there is an objective reality, like that there's just one Michael and a bunch of different perspectives on that one Michael, if there's that, then again, there's this objective reality. And each of us are sort of this, you know, tiny little observer in this big objective world. But if you understand how that idea of a singular objective world, if you understand how that actually doesn't make any sense, that there's nobody to have the perspective on that objective reality. So it's really only exists in theory in that sense. Yet we assume that there is such a thing. But if you can break out of that way of thinking, what it does is it, it puts you rather existentially right in the middle of your life. Like meaning, and I don't, I, this always sounds bad. I don't want it to sound like you're the center of the universe, but you're the center of your universe. And that's a big difference to make being the center of the universe, which is that objective world where I think I'm the most important of all of objective reality. That's different than saying there isn't an objective reality. And so the vantage point from which you have been experiencing reality your whole life, that's the center. That's the center of your experience. And if you're with me about moving away from that diluted idea of an objective reality. And if you're into this idea of being at the center of your universe, in Buddhism, they call that your Buddha land. It may not be a fully purified Buddha land yet because you might still have work to do. But the idea is, is that you only get to a purified Buddha land by coming into this like this state of being at the middle of the 10 directions, not just a little creature on planet Earth in that way. So that's the first thing I wanna mention. So now all of a sudden, if, if you're following this crazy logic that I'm laying down, you understand how, oh, there's not this one objective world 
there's an infinite number of subjective experiences and each subjective, subjective experiencer is in the middle, smack dab in the middle of their own Buddha land. Those are all of the Buddha lands that Manjushri keeps talking about. Those are all the Buddha lands that the Mahayana Sutras keep talking about. All of the, I look at all these Buddhas that I see, right? In their Buddha lands. So now when Manjushri says he wants to take all of the innumerable Buddha lands, as numerous as the grains of the, Gan of the Ganges River, and he wants to combine them, vowing to combine them into one Buddha land. To me, that sounds like what I was talking about before and what Tanya referenced in terms of the getting rid of duality, but the combining of all the Buddha lands into a single Buddha land would then sort of be this process of all of us awakening in that way, or at least that's to me, what Magistry is talking about. Does that sound good to everybody? If, if only logically, you don't need to buy it. Just good, just good sound logic, right? Great, so I have just enough time to then talk about that, that diamond on top, right? It's not a cherry on top of this, but Manjushri wants to adorn this single Buddha land with incalculable, intermingled, exquisite jewels. And of course, everybody knows this about these Buddha lands. If you go reading the Mahayana Sutras and you hear about these Buddha lands, you know you're going to hear about some jewels, right? You know you're going to hear about some dazzling spectacles in that way. And I know that for many people, when they first are introduced to like a Pure Land Sutra, one of these kind of sutras, I know it can initially be a little even off-putting where it's like, I thought these Buddhists were like supposed to be about non-attachment and stuff. Why are they talking about all of these diamonds and jewels and everything? I understand how you could read it that way. And be and and it and it seemed totally uh, kind of contradictory to the Buddhist message. But I I always like to share this teaching with with everybody. So it has to do with actually it has a lot to do with these adornments that they keep talking about, bodhisattvas adorning their Buddha lands. What a beautiful idea, right? Beautifying your Buddha land. But how do you do that? How do you adorn? How do you decorate your Buddha land? So within the Bodhisattva path, this, it's this beautiful thing that happens. And what it is, is, is this. If you have a certain mentality, it would definitely have to be the mentality that believes in that objective world. And I'll tell you why it has to do with that. If you have that view that there's just this one world that we're all in, and it's just a bunch of different perspectives on that one objective world, that way of thinking, and it's a way of thinking, that way of thinking introduces an, a very interesting aspect of reality or what is considered reality. And what that is, is, is that it allows for scarcity. What I mean is, is that if there's only one objective world, then all of a sudden something like gold, of which there is a very limited amount on earth. Well, in an objective reality, then gold could be considered valuable. Indeed, it is considered valuable. It's considered one of the most kind of valuable things on earth in that way. And why? Because it's so rare. There's, of course, other things that are considered valuable in this world. Take your pick, you know, objects and things, prized possessions and all of that. 
So all of those things could be considered precious jewels, by which I mean precious objects, precious things. A chunk of gold is going to be considered a precious object. What happens in the world of the Bodhisattva is that there's a realization that gold and silver and all of these things, the idea that those are valuable reflects a certain mentality, like I'm suggesting regarding objective reality, but also all kinds of things in terms of attachment and ownership and all of that. But what happens for the Bodhisattva is that a kind word is a jewel. It's so much more valuable than anything made of gold. And it's and in a certain, you know, I, I get it, you know, a certain mind, it would be like, oh, you know, that's that's a nice sentiment, right? Doesn't that sound like a nice sentiment that a kind word is more valuable than gold? It is a nice sentiment, but I'm actually not talking about it as a sentiment. I'm actually talking about it as a mentality that actually takes kindness, truth, things like that, and considers them jewels, precious, precious jewels in this world. And all of a sudden, what, I, what I'm getting at is that it, they, there's a way of thinking about this where they're not speaking metaphorically. It's actually a way of shifting your mind where what you value you value something totally different. And then all of a sudden, somebody is holding the hope diamond, right? The crown jewels of England. And then they, or they have some kindness. And the Bodhisattva is thinking, that's the valuable object here. Who cares about that stuff? So, all of these jewels that they keep talking about, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that they keep referring to them as virtuous adornments. They're adornments made of virtues, like being honest, like being kind, like being not violent, all of those things. And so if you start to put your mind in that way of thinking, Manju Shri wants to combine all of our Buddha lands into one Buddha land and then adorn it with exquisite intermingled jewels. Right, sign me up. So, all right, everybody, that's the first of, that's the first two of 10 vows. Uh, we're gonna explore the rest of them uh, next Sunday because there's a few very interesting ones in there. So stay tuned for that. Any last minute questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah, Tanya. Um, thanks so much. First of all, that was really beautiful. Oh, yay. And, and I was just thinking about, you know, the three jewels, right? Oh, mind blown. Tanya, you know, mind blown. You know, so just to like, as a reminder of what jewels mean in Buddhism. Sangha, Dharma, Buddha, those yeah. are the jewels. Yeah, but but also like you were saying, like a kind word and the, those virtues, and it's just, that's so, so important. Um, the, and then the other thing I was just thinking when you were talking about, um, um, sorry, like, mm -hmm. uh, all the infinite subjective experiences slash realities and then thinking it really brought to mind how you often talked about like the fullness of emptiness <laughs> you know and and co-arising is totally baked in there too which is also part of emptiness and fullness so um yeah that was excellent and the, the only way you get to that 
is by emptying that idea of objective reality. Objective, yeah, and then objective you've got reality is what is empty, right? But you've got all these this like infinite fractal subjective realities of yeah, excellent. excellent. Yeah, so so thank you. So that was yeah, so super cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was super awesome. So before I jump in, does anybody else have any other questions or? Noe, you look like you're you're you got something <laughs> baking there. No, it's just excellent. Thank you, no. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, I, I, well done. Excellent, excellent, <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, like.